rarely do something purposefully.
Johannes Müller's principle of undifferentiated coding. What that principle says is that the neural signals that are generated by our sense organs and sent to the cortex are all qualitatively the same. They only vary in intensity. As Heinz put it, he said, our senses tell us how much, but they never tell us what. That, as I say, it's been known since about 1845 or something when Johannes Miller wrote it for the first time. Psychologists know about it, but yet any course on perception will talk about information coming in from the outside to the inside. What the principle of undifferentiated coding means is that it is we who generate the qualities out of which our experiential world is built up. And these qualities are our invention on the basis of quantitative differences. And the qualities tell us nothing. They contain no information about qualities outside. Now that it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental insight. From this insight derives the realization that, as Heinz said, objectivity is the delusion that observations could be made without an observer which is a beautiful way of saying it. And the moment you have realized what it means, any form of realism is beyond, it's out of bounds. It's just not possible. Because the statement of the illusion of objectivity is incontrovertible. If you observe something, you are the observer, you have contributed to it, you have built it up in observing. And the third contribution is the one that causes the most profound resistance against constructivism. And it also derives from the two, two earlier ones. Because it simply says, if it is you who constructs your way of thinking, who constructs your experiential world and your ways of dealing with it, then you are responsible for what you do and for what you think. And that is intensely disagreeable. It's disagreeable in, in very many ways. And that is why I think other theories are far more popular if you can somehow blame your genes, or if you can blame your upbringing, or if you can blame I don't know what. It's more comfortable. You, you shelve the responsibility. Whereas if you do believe that you've constructed it yourself, you are responsible. And that does not mean that you are free to act in any way whatever, because you are always hemmed in by the constraints that you encounter. But within those constraints you make choices. And those choices are and remain your responsibility. It requires a fundamental switch that is right at the bottom of all thinking about the world. And the switch is very simply that, that you have to realize that you can have a fully furnished experiential world without knowing anything about the reality beyond it. You don't need an ontological reality in order to have your experiential world. And that is totally revolutionary because in the whole history of philosophy, epistemology, which is the theory of knowing, if you like, was based on the notion that knowledge is useless unless it is a picture of a reality that is outside. So if you come and say, well, I don't need that reality, people think, oh, well, this is just the dreaming, this is fiction. What they don't realize is that you have to build 
your own experiential reality in such a way that it's livable, that it works in your life. Most people think that once you've said those things, that there is no reality whatsoever. There is the reality that you and other people in social interaction with them have created. And that is the one you have to stick to. Because you can't afford when you are, I don't know, 25 or 30, let alone when you are 80, to undo the things on which you have acted all your life. On, it's the, on the other uh, hand, what? it isn't undoing. It's the pi it is the piling up of something that you can discard because it's, it's no longer. I'm one. sorry, I don't hear you. It's, it's something that you discard. Well, you can't discard it if it's been useful all along. You're going to use it again. You discard things when they cease to be useful. When, when they lose their viability because of changes in the situation or changes in your capacities or whatever. But uh, it's the experiential reality that you have to be true to that. And it's just as binding as an outside reality while you're using it. You mentioned in, in the program here the sort of the metaphor of, of the man who walks through the forest. That's, I think it's a very good metaphor, but I'll tell it in a slightly different version, mm -hmm. if you like. Yes. And the version is this, there's a blind man, blind man who for some reason or other has to be moved from one village to another. He's taken to the new village, he's shown his room, and he's more or less left there. People are looking after him, they bring him food and whatnot. But there he's in his room, he opens the door, he knows nothing about the new village. So he very carefully begins to move with his stick and moves where he can go. And every now and then he hits an obstacle. And then he changes direction or he moves in another way. Well, after a week or ten days, that man would be able to move quite well in the vicinity of his house. After four weeks or two months, he would be able to move through the entire village without difficulty. And in that sense, he will know the village. But what is it he knows? He knows only where there are places where he can't walk where his stick has hit on an obstacle. He knows where he can walk freely. And because he's sensitive to distances from his own walking and whatnot, he knows that if I take ten paces this way, I have to turn to the right. And from then on, he can walk quite happily through the village. He can talk to people. He can do almost everything he has to in the village. But he doesn't know the village. He has his own map. And the map is not the village, but it's the map of his possibilities of walking. That is the position in which we are vis-à-vis -vis reality. We know a few things that it allows us to do. Could you speak to realism for a moment? To realism? It's an epistemological position, if you like, that is enormously wide because there have been innumerable different kinds of realism. Uh, they all have in common, or at least should have in common, the notion that the picture we have of the world has in some way, uh, is in some way a representation of what is out there. It's, uh, it mostly brings with it the notion that truth means a good match between my picture of the world and what is out there. It's a good likeness, if you like. So that's why I say if you have understood the principle of constructivism, uh, that's out of balance that is just not thinkable any longer. And if it's not thinkable, you realize 
that almost everything else you have thought before has to be modified. And that is a very difficult and in some way painful process. And I think it's, it's very, very understandable that people fight against it. That's why I don't think that constructivism will ever be a general theory. I think it's just too uncomfortable. <laughs> Thank you.